So I'm just curious, how many people just came from Jeff Dice's talk? We're, okay, great, a lot of you were down there. So for people watching online, Jeff gave a very rousing, uh, getting y'all fired up, saying it's our duty to go out there and fight statism and promote liberty. So you're getting all excited, and then you say, but they have a lot of guns and nuclear weapons. <laughs> so huddle up, everyone, here's what we're gonna do. All right. <laughs> okay, so this, this talk uh, is about, as, as the images here convey, is talking about what is probably one of the hardest practical objections. So in terms of the ethics, a lot of people can say, yeah, I, I agree in the non-aggression principle. And it's funny, if you're talking to normal people, they understand that as well. Or you're, you're at the park or something, you got your little kids playing, and the one there's, a, there's some kid's bike there that's not being used, and some other kid wants to go just play with it. The parent hopefully will say, well, you got to get permission first. And then even if 10 of the kids show up and eight of them vote that they should all be able to use that bike, and one of the kids who doesn't agree is the, you know, the kid whose family owns it, hopefully most of the parents would say, sorry, maybe that person's being selfish or whatever, but no, you can't take something that's not yours. And, you know, majority opinion doesn't matter. They don't think like that, those grown-ups, when they go home and then it becomes November time. Then all of a sudden those rules go out the window. So it, it is interesting how, you know, there, there are these, these packages or these boxes people think of in terms of what normal sorts of rules of morality would apply. And I'm sure you've heard this too, that one way of thinking about libertarianism in the Rothbardian tradition is just taking the standard rules of morality and extending them to everybody to not make exemptions for certain classes of people. So, you know, forced servitude is wrong. And so then how can you draft people or how can you compel people to serve on a jury if they're really busy and they don't want to do it? You know, things like that. Uh, taking, you know, theft is wrong. Of course, taxation isn't considered that by a lot of people. And yet as memes inform me, taxation is theft, in fact. So there's, there's that element. Mass murder, most people would say, is wrong. Yet that's clearly what happens in warfare. Okay, and so th that's one way of looking at it. But with a lot of people, they might agree with that stuff. They might agree that, yeah, we, should, we could privatize the roads. Yeah, certainly the post office doesn't need a, a monopoly on first-class mail delivery. Schools, I could see them being completely private. Yep, yep, healthcare, got it, got it, go on through. But when it comes to the police and the legal code itself, for a lot of people, that seems pretty tough. And then also, gee, you know, isn't warfare something like, you know, how, how could... Uh, a private company, as, as cool as Google is, can it really defeat, you know, Nazi Germany in a war, right? So that's the kind of mentality. So that's the sort of thing we're going to be addressing in this talk. Let me mention, I've been, I've been doing this several years now at Mises U. I typically run out of time at the end where I want to field common objections. And so what I'm going to do this year is go more quickly through the opening material so that I can hopefully have more time at the end. And so I would say, if, if you've never seen me give this talk before, later, you know, go, go to YouTube if you want and try to look up, you know, Robert Murphy, the market for security, Mises U, and you'll see a whole list. Grab one when I don't have a beard, because that's going to be from earlier, and go ahead and watch that if you're curious and you want to see me elaborate more on some of the stuff in the beginning. Okay, another quick caveat before I jump into the main material, because this confuses people. Several years ago, I wrote a lot on pacifism, just trying to ex explain to Rothbardian types that, that, hey, you know, you, you've seen how the case for aggression is overblown and actually a society that refrains from initiating force wouldn't be sitting ducks the way most people think. And so then I was even going further and saying, yeah, actually, maybe the case for defensive violence perhaps is overrated. And I was just, you know, showing people that. And there's different uh, traditions. You know, if you, if you uh, like Tolstoy, for example, the kingdom of God is within you coming from a Christian tradition, but also just... There's, uh, you know, Gandhi or the civil rights movement in the United States. There's various historical examples of people who have used nonviolent tactics to achieve social change and to stop a much better armed, much more physically powerful foe. And so I do just want to make a note of that. Um, look, in the, the one thing I'll say here is this stuff, it's not just like, oh, we don't want to hurt a fly and we're not very organized. There's this misconception that nonviolent uh, conflict resolution or something is is real uh, pansy and not really rigorous. That's not true. Like there's a very well developed argumentation and tactics, strategic thought that goes into some of these movements. So, for example, when I was in Nashville, there was a museum uh, exhibit for they had training sessions for the civil rights movement, and they would do things like say, okay, we're going to pick this place. You know, it was segregated. Um, a counter, lunchtop counter, so we're going to have a sit-in. 
We're going to have a chain of people all holding hands. Now the, the mob's going to come and they're going to start beating us. We cannot throw a punch. If we throw one punch in response, we're done. Public opinion will turn. We have to sit there and take it, let them spit at us, try to engage them in conversation. They might be less likely to punch you in the face. And if, if somebody you can tell is just getting beat too badly, let him come in the middle of us and other people fan out you know, on the perimeter and take the beatings then. So this is the way, like they were training for this, going into this with that mentality. So whether you agree with that or not, I'm just saying it was not simply you know, just a thing like, hey, let's just hope it all works out. They were really strategically planning it because they knew we're in the minority, we're vastly outgunned, this is the only chance we have. So I just want to mention that. So what I'm doing in this talk is I'm just, as an economist, explaining market forces. So the analogy I use is, I don't think excessive heroin use is a good idea. I actually think it would be immoral. But if you're asking me as economists, what does the market look like if we legalize drugs, I could sit there and as an economist explain the buyers and the sellers and prices and so forth. So clearly, if we got rid of the government's monopoly on legal judicial rulings and military defense, most people are not pacifists. And so they would certainly pay money to have violent armed defense to repel invaders or private criminals. And so that, that's what I'm doing here. Okay. Pri I'm gonna spend more of the talk on private law versus private defense because I think private law is actually the conceptually difficult thing. As you'll see, once we understand how would people know who the proper owner was or what, you know, the, the proper assignment of property titles, then to say, how could we defend those things from people who violently try to invade them, that's actually a pretty simple problem, relatively speaking, okay? So that's why I'm gonna spend more time talking about uh, the case for private law than private defense. So before I sort of get into the positive exposition of here's practically speaking how I think pr a private legal system could work, let me just mention a lot of the initial sort of knee-jerk reactions people have in terms of objections, it sounds crazy, and I, I grant you that it does. The first time you hear this stuff, it sounds like how could that possibly work? But I just wanna walk you through and show those sort of immediate instinctive reactions and to say, come on, this, this doesn't even make any sense. If you applied it in other areas of social life, you would see those objections would be silly. Okay, so for example, um, you, you might talk about that how could there be multiple uh, power centers? You know, doesn't there need to be one body promulgating all the rules to have a rule of law, right? It seems like how could you have competition when it comes to the legal code? Because clearly we need one group to be absolutely dominant and in charge to set us, you know, to establish, to promulgate the law, right? That, that sounds sensible when you hear it in that context of someone's walking along and saying, why do we need a state monopoly on the legal code or legislation? How could you have competition in that arena that boggles my mind? And I want to point out that's not what's true in science, right? Imagine if somebody said to you, we need to have one group of people backed up by guns with absolute undisputed authority to tell us what the laws of physics are. Otherwise, it would just be chaos. You'd have various people all over the world saying different things about the laws of physics and it would just be a jumble. You clearly need to have one group promulgating the laws of physics. Right? You, you see how silly that would be. It's not just that it's wrong, that would be horrifying if we did go that path, right? If that's the way science proceeded, that we anointed one group of experts and said, you get to tell us what the laws of, of science are, you know, biology, chemistry, so forth. Okay, so you, you see how okay, clearly that doesn't work in that category. Now, you might push back a little bit against me there and say, okay, yeah, you're right. In that analogy you used, that type of objection would be silly. Competition clearly works. In the, in the physical sciences, but you might say that's because there really are physical laws of nature, right? It's not that they're arbitrary. There, there are objectively true laws out there, or at least that seems to be the case if we think nature behaves in an orderly fashion. And so what the scientists are doing is trying to approximate them. So if scientists are disagreeing, there's an objective way to settle the dispute. They can run an experiment if it's something, you know, that's a repeatable experiment. Clearly, there's a sense in which there's an objective fact of the matter, and that's why the better scientists win out over time, and there can be some type of consensus using that term loosely. You know, you know where I'm coming from with that. Whereas they might say when it comes to things that involve human conventions like property titles, there's, it's not the case that the owner of Mama Goldberg's, that, you know, the building next door, that establishment, you could say that's not as objectively true and out there as a feature of nature 
the way the charge on an electron is. So, just, so yes, I agree with you, Murphy. We don't need one agency to be in charge of telling us what the charge on an electron is because anybody can go measure that and figure it out. And the people running the better experiments can demonstrate the superiority of their technique to the community. Whereas something like to say, who owns Mama Goldberg's, one might think, is far more arbitrary in just a mere social convention. It's not something that's like embedded in the nature of reality per se. And so you might think that's why their competition doesn't work very well. But what about the definitions of words? Okay, clearly language in a sense is a human convention. That's, you know, the, what the definition of words is not analogous to the charge on an electron. It's much closer, I think you would agree with me, to this, to say who owns Mama Goldberg's. And yet that's not arbitrary either. And so let's spend just a minute on this. What happens... Uh, you might say, well, who, who determines what words mean, right? If, if there's some dispute over the meaning of a particular term, right? So somebody says, well, that Paul Krugman, he's such an oxymoron, right? And so other people might say, he's a moron perhaps, but he's not an oxymoron. I think you're using that word wrong. And you're like, no, that's what it means. It means he's a super moron. You're like, no, so how do you resolve that? You go and you look in a dictionary and you look up oxymoron to see what it says, okay? So does that mean the people who publish Webster's Dictionary get to define words? Are they the authorities on what words mean? Superficially, you might say yes. You might say, yeah, because look at what we just did. We have a disagreement, we go to the book. But no, let's think that through a little bit more carefully. If Webster's put out its new edition of the dictionary next year, and in it, the word up, you know, UP, the definition it gave was tending to move towards the floor, what would happen? It's not that we would all say, I stand corrected. I've been using that word wrong my whole life, <laughs> right? That's not what you, people would mock them. They would screenshot it, you know, put it around Twitter, mocking them like, who are the, you know, the wizards that let this one slip through the quality control process? Because they, how would we describe it? Webster's published the wrong definition. We would know that is wrong. That's not what that word means. Okay, so what they're actually doing with dictionaries is they're codifying the definitions as the community of English speakers defines the words or uses the words. Okay, again, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna move quickly here. In earlier uh, years of this, I, I would spend some time on this because the analogy between private language and private law is pretty strong and, and really you can, there's several layers of them. As, you, as far as you wanna push it, you can see connections between the two. For example, something like a grammar style guide. You know, you can have, a, situations and saying like a particular English sentence to say, I done went to the store yesterday, that's clearly ungrammatical, right? That's not standard English, that's clearly wrong. Whereas something, other cases might be a little bit more borderline, like to say, hey, who'd you go to the store with? And some people might get real uptight and say, oh, you should never end a sentence with a proposition, or the preposition, right? It's, like, it's attributed to Winston Churchill. He says, that is something up with which I shall not put. But I don't know if he actually said that, but you can see that, you know, it's, it's cumbersome sometimes that you say, ah, with whom did you go to the store yesterday, right, you see? And so people could argue about whether it's ungrammatical or preferred, and, you know, there can be borderline cases, and that's what happens when it comes to private law. You clearly know if you just, you're walking in the park and some lady's pushing a baby around a stroller and you just go up and drop a rock on the baby's face, that is illegal. You just broke the law, right? There's no doubt about that. No reputable legal scholar would possibly dispute, whereas the baby pulls out a gun and starts, he's about to shoot you, and then you do it, you know, maybe it's Stewie or something from uh, Family Guy, <laughs> then maybe it, it is okay, you know, so it's, and there it's more borderline, right? So you see what I'm saying, that that's the type of thing, just like with, you know, style guides and so on. So that's the analogy, you can really push that. But clearly, my point here is, if you said who's in charge of the English language, you could answer, you could say nobody, and that there's a sense in which that's true, or you could say the English-speaking community, because notice, if you go and read Shakespeare, that's English, but it's not our English, right? There's the way that was written, there are things in there that, you know, how now, Polonius, and stuff like that, and it's not, it, it's not the way we would talk now, but yet it's not German either. It's English, but it's changed over time. So definitions, styles change, and yet there is a sense at any given moment, there's a fact of the matter, is this a grammatical sentence or is this person using this word correctly here? And so I'm saying that's kind of how the, the private legal system would work, that over time the law would, would change, right? Before there was uh, technology that could use radio spectrum, 
you didn't have property rights in the electromagnetic spectrum. That wouldn't even have come up to people living you know, in the year 1200 if they were all Rothbardians back then. Right. Whereas, you know, over time, eventually they would have to address that issue. Maybe they would decide it, you can't own it. But the point is, conflict would arise once there were pirate radio stations and, and people were trying to use radio tr uh, transmissions. And some people were interfering with what other people wanted to do. All right. So that's a, a pretty good analogy, I think, for that element. Now, you might push back again. You might say, hang on, let me not jump to the chase here. You might say, OK. You've, you've shown me, Murphy, that mere human convention, also there's a sense in which there could be a fact of the matter and so on, but you know what? There's not a lot of money riding on the definition of up. There, no one stands to gain if we tweak the definition of up to mean going down towards the surface, whereas a judge whose job it is or some clerk somewhere who's in, in charge of maintaining the property titles in Auburn, Alabama, and if we had a dispute over who owns Mama Goldberg, if, if we could convince people that, oh, no, this person's the rightful owner, that's a big deal. That really matters. And so maybe they would you know, pay the person who maintains those property titles and corrupt them. So whereas with a dictionary, clearly the, the profitable thing to do is for Webster's to always codify the standard definitions. You know, they, dictionaries might differ slightly. There's competition even among dictionaries, notice publishers. But they would generally agree on the basics. And you can see how market forces would ensure that. But you, again, you could say because no one stands to gain a billion dollars from changing a definition. And so you might say, so that's why this analogy, OK, it works a little bit, but not when it comes to property titles, because clearly there, there's a lot at stake. And so why would we trust a decentralized market process? Why would the, the legitimate property titles be recognized in the system? Why would that be the profitable thing to do? I'm not as sure. And so. You know, granted, yes, these things aren't literally the same. They're analogies. But let me just point out, you know, we also have stipulations of what standard units of measurement are. And so do you really think, um, imagine, you know, it's a free society. We're all big fans of Rothbard. People sign a contract and it says, okay, I agree to work for you for eight hours. And at the end of my shift, you're going to give me five silver coins. And we sign a contract that specifies that. So the shift is over, you work your eight hours, the employer comes out and he drops three pebbles into your hand. He says, there you go, there's the, the eight silver coins or whatever I said. And, and you, you said, what, what are you talking about? These are, these are three pebbles, you said eight silver coins. And he went, yeah, that, that's one, two, eight. That's how I count. <laughs> and you know, this is what silver, what you, what is of course there's a silver coin. There's, things are all over the beach. I don't know why they're so valuable, but they are. And you, you know, you see what I'm saying? So if the person just saying, no, what I meant in that contract, the definition, when I wrote that you know, thing that looked like two circles like that, it, to me it's one, two, eight, that's how I count. What's your problem? Is there any, you know, it, would the community just say, ah, we thought freedom was gonna work, but apparently it doesn't? <laughs> no, what the community would say is this guy's lying or he's crazy. And that sort of thing would not fly. Okay, the community, now, if the guy says, oh, by the way, and then like 16 guys with bazookas come out, maybe he gets away with that and you just say, oh, thanks for the eight silver coins and you walk away. Well, first of all, you're gonna quit, right? So that's one way that you're gonna limit that sort of thing. But you're gonna tell all your friends, the community is gonna know that that guy stole from you, that he stole your eight hours, all right? The community is not going to say, ah, the ambiguity of language, <laughs> right? That's not what's gonna happen, they're gonna know. So my, my point again with this stuff is, yes, they're gonna be borderline cases and maybe corruption will be involved, but in terms of somebody had that plot of land in their family for generations, they went out, they, they justly you know, got the trees, nobody ever objected to how they bought the lumber and they built this thing and they put the sign up and it was uh, a woman who was a mother and her last name was Goldberg and she put a sign up saying Mama Goldberg and then somebody came in from out of town that no one ever seen before at gunpoint, kicks her out of the house, comes in and says, guess what, this is my house because of the, I'm a, you know, the, the way you guys read these contracts is wrong. I'm changing the definition. If they have superior physical force, they might get away with it, but everybody knows that person just stole from her. It's not that we wouldn't know the fact of the matter and who is the rightful owner of that house. Also, too, again, with all these things, let me just say this before I forget and move on, it's always a comparative analysis here. So it's not my job to prove to you corruption of judges or the maintenance of property titles will never happen even one single time in a free society. 
my claim is it would happen a lot less than it does right now. Okay, so it's, it's, if, it's as if people say, oh yeah, because judges might be corrupt in a free society, that's why we got to have the present system when judges are horribly corrupt under the present system all the time, right? So it's, a, it's an institutional uh, comparison. Okay, so why don't I walk through a quick example just to kind of show you the mechanics in practice, how might this work in a modern society? So let's talk about a TV thief. So I, I'm, you know, I live in a, a, su a suburb. I'm driving home, and I see someone go going out of my apartment with a big TV on his back, and he runs away. And so I go in. Oh, my TV is gone. What do I do? I go and I check the the video footage, and it's it's the, I think it's the kid that lives down the street. You know, it looks like him on the video. And so I could go and. Uh, present my kid, you know, I might just go to the person and, and say, hey, you took my TV, give it back. And the kid says, what are you talking about? I didn't do it. And so what do I do there? Now, I might, in, the, in an abstract sense, have the right ethically, if, if, especially if I'm convinced, but suppose I look around and I think I see my TV in there, I might have the, the, the right to just barge in. And if it's, you know, I could probably take the kid, right? Especially if he's like, <laughs> he's like 15 or younger. I bet you I get it. But... <laughs> I wouldn't do that. It would be foolish for me to do that because then if the kid's going around, especially if I have to rough him up, I'm going to look like a jerk. You know, if, I, if he gets a black eye or something, I'm going to look like maybe I aggressed. The community's not going to know. So what do I do is, now one thing is moving into the suburb where we probably have signed stuff ahead of time saying disputes will be resolved. I'm trying to make it harder on myself. What if we didn't have that? What if I didn't have any sort of nexus of a pre-existing contractual framework to deal with this kind of dispute with this person? Maybe it's someone who lives several neighborhoods away and we, you know, there were no contractual arrangements between us. I would go to members of the community, judges who render opinions. That's what judges do, right? You notice judges don't, the language we use nowadays is we say the judge wrote an opinion. So what they're doing is they're saying, this is my interpretation, my understanding is how the law applies to these facts of the case. That's what judges are doing fundamentally. And so that's what I would do here is I would say, okay, you know what? I'm going to take all this evidence. I have the video footage, the serial number on my you know, TV that I went to Best Buy. I can get them to tell me what was it. And then he says, oh, well, the, the serial number on my TV has, has been scratched away. You know, because when I was bringing it in, I slipped and it rubbed against the wall. Sorry. You know, and so I, there's all kinds of circumstantial evidence like that. All the evidence I can amass, and I'll go to a bunch of judges in the community who all specialize in um, home, home uh, theft, right, burglary cases. And I'll, and I'll say, there's, there's 10 reputable judges in the community who all specialize. They have whole careers where all they do day in and day out is hear cases of people alleging this person broke into my house. So they're experts on this. The reason they're in business is because they have a reputation for fairness, right? Th that that's why they have that job. And if you've never thought about this, it might sound like science fiction or it wouldn't work, but this happens all the time. Like when people get divorced right now, unless it's a really expensive case and there's a lot of money at stake, usually they will just go to private arbitration just to get it over with, right? Just to hurry, you just want to move on with your life. Or, you know, a company and the employee have a dispute over the labor contract, the, the employee got sick and says, you owe me more time. The company says, no, we, we don't owe you that, those wages. The, the, the regular government court system is so clogged and inefficient, they will often go to mediation. And often, too, the, you know, the labor contracts ahead of time say any disputes will be submitted to binding arbitration. So how do those companies right now in the real world, this isn't something like that's out of Chapter 8 from Rothbard. This is in the real world. There are arbitrators in business. That's their livelihood. They clearly, it can't be known if you're a divorce arbitrator, you always rule for the wife or the husband. Otherwise, you would stop getting cases because the one party wouldn't agree to go to that person. You see what I'm saying? So all they're doing is rendering an opinion. So here, I would be saying to this teenager that I thought stole my TV, or his parents, okay, I'm willing to pick, here's a list of 10 people in the community, I'm willing to go to any of them to submit this case, and I will abide by the, the judge's decision. If the judge says well, there's not enough evidence to prove that's my TV, okay, I tried, I'll walk away. And suppose that, you know, so the teenager can agree to it, in which case it's fine, we do that, or the, the, he'll just keep saying, no, no, I don't trust those guys. And what if he says, I'll hear, with this guy over here, it was my brother-in-law. You know, I'll take the case to him. The community then at that point would realize, okay, this kid is being shady, and right. And so what I would do in that case is I would go to a respected member of the community, submit my <laughs> evidence. He renders an opinion. 
Okay, and so Napoleon looks at the evidence. So obviously I'm using this to be funny. Clearly what I would do in the real world is pick some judge who doesn't know who I am, obviously. But, and so the community would see, okay, yeah, Murphy took his case to a reputable judge who's an expert in this area. The judge said, my understanding of the law, yep, this person is the thief. And then the sentences or the, or the restitution is return the TV plus whatever, 10 ounces of gold in restitution or whatever, an ounce of gold or for, for Murphy's time in trouble. So that would be this outstanding judgment. Now, how would that get enforced? Now here, I would, now I would be legally in the right. The community would not object if I personally knocked on the kid's door and then went to go in and take my TV. And, or even, and, maybe, and maybe if the kid used a standard checking you know, bank account, maybe the bank would transfer the money you know, in terms of the compensation because the bank wants to also be in compliance with the law. The community wouldn't want to think this is a bank where criminals go to hide their ill-gotten gains and the bank doesn't care about legal opinions that are, you know, are not being disputed by the reputable legal community. Okay, so again, if, if the kid showed up in court and challenged it, there could be an appeal process and so on. What I'm talking about here is suppose Napolitano makes his ruling and the kid just says, ah, he's a fraud, I don't care, and he's not going through normal legal channels to appeal it such that any normal legal scholar would look at this in two minutes and say, yeah, it looks like Murphy's TV got stolen by that kid, if you ask me. So th I'm, this is the stage where we are. So here, I could now go into the kid's house and take the TV back with force, and the community wouldn't think I was a criminal. But I probably wouldn't, just for reasons of comparative advantage and so on. I would outsource it to somebody whose firm specializes in like property recovery. right? So somebody else would come in, that that's what that person's job is. Somebody who specializes in the use of violence. OK. so. <laughs> Now, notice even here, think, let's think this through. Okay, so I'm, I'm just trying to get you to see there's no one group that's in charge of the law here. I picked Napolitan, but there are 10 competing judges who are all experts that I could have picked and said. It's not that Andrew Napolitano is in charge of who gets TVs in this certain jurisdiction. That's not the way it works. He's just someone who's called upon to render an opinion, just like if you're writing a term paper and you're not sure about, well, gee, the, the professor wanted me to use the Chicago style manual to cite, you know, in the work cited section. There's different, you know, you could go Google it. There's lots of websites where you could go look that stuff up. It's not that there's one website in charge of here's how you cite papers. Okay, so same thing here. The law is what the community through its actions collectively promulgates, just like we all, in a sense, determine English language or diction, uh, definitions but you just go to look for an authoritative style guide or source to codify that. Okay, likewise, it's not that Tom DiLorenzo's agency is the monopoly enforcement agency in the community. They're, they're one of several competing ones. If I went to him before I got the judicial ruling and said, hey, this kid stole my TV, here's the video, DiLorenzo's firm would say, whoa, we don't, we don't do that. You have to go get a ruling from a reputable judge first before we enforce that. We're not in the business of legal decisions. All we do is enforce just legal opinions. You, you, so you see that difference? So this is something that I think even in the standard libertarian uh, tradition doesn't get emphasized too much. I think in practice, the judges would be their own separate thing and the enforcement agencies would be completely separate entity. They would not just all be working like for the same insurance company the way you see it in some of the more canonical expositions. Maybe they would. I'm just saying, to me, those things are so intrinsically different, I don't see why they would happen to be the same agencies. I think the, the insurance company might you know, have contracts with them to, to outsource that stuff so there's no confusion once something, like, once a case is pending to know, okay, where are we, who are we going to hire to take care of this? But I don't think it would be the same group of people. If for no other reason, you'd want to assure the community that there was no corruption involved. You'd want to have a hand's length, arm's length uh, distance between them. One more thing on this before I move on. Suppose DiLorenzo's f agents are unnecessarily rough. You know, suppose they, they, put like explosives, they blow the door, they burn the kid's house down, <laughs> they kill him and, and his dogs and stuff to get the TV back, he's going to go out of business. Maybe he's going to be legally protected, right? Depending on the legal code, maybe if they can argue in some sense that, oh, we, we were feared for our lives, okay, maybe, it depends on what the legal system is, probably not, depending on how egregious their overzealousness in, in getting that TV back would be. But for sure, no matter what, they're going out of business. Nobody else is hiring them again because I look bad. 
right? That I don't want that. It's bad press for me, especially if I were a business, right? If you're a storekeeper and you're hiring private security just to keep to minimize shoplifting, you don't want teenagers bolting out of the store who just have like you know, a radio or something or some candy bars under their jacket. You don't want them getting their arms broken by the security. That's just, that's bad for business. And so what DiLorenzo's firm would actually do in this case is show up, you know, they might have like riot gear, you know, bulletproof vests and stuff to protect themselves, but they would not use lethal force to get a TV back. That would just be a bad business move. Okay. So, and if they did, again, competition, they would go out of business. Whereas right now what happens when the police force is clearly overzealous in doing something, what happens is people put the video on Facebook or Twitter and, and there's outrage and the defenders say, oh, okay, well, the next time someone's breaking into your house, I guess you're not going to call 911, huh? The reason people think like that is because they think there's the police, period. Whereas if there's multiple competing agencies, then you would no longer think that. If one agency was clearly using excessive force, they go out of business. Just like right now, if somebody goes to a restaurant and gets food poisoning, and, and, and complains on Facebook, oh, I went there and I was thrown up for three days. People don't say, oh, well, the next time you're hungry, I guess you're just going to go to your backyard garden and grow it yourself, huh? <laughs> right? You know, I guess you, you like restaurants or not. You don't, it's not, do I like restaurants or not? It's that particular restaurant made me sick, all right? Okay, so would there be prisons in a free society? So this is an interesting question. Uh, again, it, it depends on the clientele. I, I imagine if things switch next Thursday, that yes, given the uh, desire for retribution and, the, and the, the way people think about things right now in their value system, I do think initially there might be prisons. I think over time in a genuinely free society that most crimes, the punishment would end up morphing into mere uh, financial restitution, right? I think like the, the aggrieved party would realize like somebody kills somebody, the next of kin would realize no matter what the you know putting that person in the cage or killing him is not going to bring dad back and then also just re in terms of rehabilitation that if the person feels like i can go work make a bunch of money and pay this th these victims back you might feel like you're easing the guilt and move on with your life whereas you kind of know if i just sit in a cage and have horrible things done to me by other inmates and have got you know prison the, the guards beating me up and i'm making license plates I actually haven't paid my debt to society, right? So even in terms of just getting the, the criminals, either you lock them up forever or try to actually make them rehabilitated, I think the punitive mentality is, is creating more crime. But that doesn't matter. That's just my personal opinion. What I'm talking here as an economist, how would this work initially is I think that the prisons would be like hotels, but it would be like the Hotel California, all right? And so... <laughs> What I mean here is, no matter what, let's say there's, an out, you know, there's some axe murderer running around. We, we have him on video camera. We go to a bunch of judges. They render opinion. They look at it and say, yes, this person, Joe Smith, is an axe murderer, and he, you know, he needs to offer, offer all this restitution, and he's just on the run. It's, you know, people wonder, do we have the right to go grab him? You, know, what's the, you don't need to worry about that stuff. Because remember, every parcel of land is owned by someone in a, in a free society. So all you would need is, in a case like that, where it's crystal clear that someone really is just a mass murderer or serial killer on the run, that all you, or you know, a bank robber or something who's, who's staying one step ahead of the, of the law, all that would have to happen is all the property owners would say, get off my property, right? You, you, you notice you always have the right to do that. It's not that we have to worry is there some intrinsic right for us to physically grab someone and put him in a cage if he's been convicted of a certain crime? You don't need to worry about that. Everyone has the right to say, I don't want you on my property. And so in this kind of a world, if someone were a true pariah, I think there would be a role either from profit maximizing organization, firms or like philanthropic or you know, church organizations who want to rehabilitate uh, the criminals that would say, hey, this is like a relative oasis. You can all come here. Now, of course, we're going to search you for weapons. We're, you know, we're going to have control your movements. You, you know, you're, you're, we're not going to give you steak knives for dinner, things like that, if you're a violent criminal. But we're going to work with you. We're going to allow you to work, right? Like maybe someone's a brilliant architect, and he came home and saw, you know, someone cheating with his wife, and he went nuts and killed, you know, killed him. Well, you know, it, it doesn't do anybody any good if that person can no longer work. It just sits in a cage. That doesn't help anybody. So maybe he, you know, has supervised. He can still do architectural work but he's in this kind of secure facility to make sure he can't get out because the rest of the community says, we don't want you around us. You're too violent. You, you know, if you snap, you kill people, 
you can't work at a regular architectural firm, but maybe they could come up with something. And so these firms would compete with each other, right? So different, they probably wouldn't call themselves prisons, they would probably call themselves something else, but we might look at that and say, oh, that's kind of like what prisons are in their world. But the point is there'd be multiple ones, and it's not that some central group grabs a guy and says, you're going here, buddy, for 30 years. It's that most of the community says, you're a convicted serial killer, or you're a convicted, you know, you killed your wife, get off my property. And then these places would arise to say, come on in, you can stay here under supervision, to, and they would compete with each other. So if their staff beat up the, the inmates, you know, what we would call inmates, they might call them residents or something, then you would just go somewhere else, okay? Because there would be competition there. So, so just notice the, the, the interplay of market forces there. So the worst horrors of what happens to people in the current prison system wouldn't happen here. Now, um, I'm going to move quickly here because, again, I want to get to the objections, but in terms of what about parole? Like, okay, so how, what determines how long do you stay in there or not? I think what would happen is third-party groups would vouch for people, right? That, and you see versions of this now, and it's, again, this stuff isn't mere, this is not just science fiction. All of these things, like if you read my pamphlet, Chaos Theory, or if you read, um, uh, you know, Hans Hoppe has done a lot of stuff on military defense, Rothbard and Four New Liberty, has some things. Um, you know, we, we, the Bruce Benson draws on a lot of stuff. There, there are historical precedent for this thing, so we're not just making this up, spinning it merely as science fiction. But right now, you know, there's there's fraternal organizations. There's things in which, if you do something wrong, then the group backing you up pays for it. You know, they go ahead and they make the victim whole, and then you got to settle up with them. The, the analogy here, just a simple one, is something like medical malpractice insurance, right? That you're a brain surgeon. If you screw up and there's a big lawsuit against you, you might owe millions of dollars to the next of kin if you, you know, kill the person on the table and it's, it's shown that it's, you did something really wrong, it's malpractice, and the doctor might not have the money. So what happens is you have to, you know, a hospital, there, there's regulations, but even in a free society, the hospital might insist any brain surgeon working here has to have medical malpractice insurance. So the insurance company covers the person, and clearly they're going to, you know, look at you and make, see what your record is for you to be able to get medical and malpractice insurance. If you never went to medical school, you're probably not going to be eligible. So likewise here, somebody who, you know, that architect, he flipped out, he's been, you know, under supervision for 10 years, he's been seeing psychologists, whatever, some outside group might come and say, all right, um, if you pay us $10,000 a year, we will vouch for you in the outside community and say, if you ever get convicted of another violent crime, we promise to you know, compensate your victims, and then you know, you're just going to settle up with us. And again, the more violent the person had been or whatever, the higher the premiums, just like you get in a bunch of car accidents, your car insurance premiums are higher. There might be things like that. And so other areas of the community might say, okay, yeah, you can come into this shopping mall if you've got this outside group vouching for you. If you do anything while you're in here shopping, then we know we're getting compensated. Someone might not rent you an apartment. You know, that might still be a little bit too leery. You see, so, so that everyone just gets to decide what their own rules are going to be. So integrating people back into society, I think, would be much more humane. And more importantly, if the group screwed up, if they let somebody out who actually went back and started killing people again, they're on the hook for it. Whereas right now, the way the system works, you go and see the parole board. If they screw up and let you out and you go back and kill more people, it's not that the people on the parole board are out a bunch of money. You know, worst case, they might get fired if they keep doing that or some, or they might feel bad. But you see how they're not strictly liable for the full consequences of what they did. Whereas in this system, the, you know, the firms or whatever that might vouch for somebody, they might, they might call it fraternal organizations. There could be different names they would use. You can see how they would be uh, on the hook for it. So I think insurance companies would, would fill this, this vacuum. Okay, uh, as far as military defense, do this really fast. So here the mechanism is, I think it would be insurance would provide the funding. So you have big skyscrapers, let's say Manhattan area skyscrapers. There's no government military defense. How could a free society pay for that? Well, you, you these skyscrapers have things like fire insurance policies, right? If there's a big fire. You could, you could be out millions of dollars, so you have insurance. And part of what the insurance company would do for a huge skyscraper is say, you better have sprinkler systems, you better have fire extinguishers installed every such and such yards, da, 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 all this kind of stuff. 
I want, to, I want you to have adequate stairwells and ways that the people in the building can get out in case there is a fire and go through you know, troubleshooting and have outside firms come in, experts analyze the building plans and make sure this is up to, there wouldn't be government codes, but there would be private sector analogs of safety codes to know this is the modern way we build skyscrapers to minimize damage and, and death during a, a major fire. And then if you complied with all that stuff, you would be able to get fire insurance policies. So likewise, it, it, if you're the owner, you stand to lose a lot if some outside military comes in and drops bombs on your skyscraper. And so you could have insurance that says in the event that you're conquered by an outside army or that you know it's d damaged because bombers drop bombs on it or artillery or so forth, naval guns hit it, we will compensate you. And so now the insurance company that's making that pledge is on the hook for potentially billions of dollars of damage claims. And so they would have the incentive to spend money to minimize the chance of that happening. So it's the insurance companies getting funding from premiums that owners are paying them. That's how they have the money. They're not taxing anybody. But now they have hundreds of millions or billions, depending on how big an area we're talking about, flowing into their coffers. And then they know if we just can make sure that nobody ever conquers them or drops bombs here, we get to keep this money. But if somebody does come in and hurts them militarily, then we're on the hook for compensating. So they're the ones who are going to go and you know, fund people like who are going to maintain tanks, anti-aircraft, SAM sites, satellite observations, things like that. Right? So that's the, the basic funding mechanism. And again, if you want to read more I, in my pamphlet, Chaos Theory, check that out. One thing I will mention is this sort of thing is not going to happen. So number one, we're clearly not going to use swastikas. That's just bad PR <laughs> altogether. That's not good for anybody. But what I'm talking about here is large standing armies. That is not going to be a profit maximizing outcome. Just like look at agriculture, right? Over time, what happens? The amount of people in agriculture shrinks over time because productivity goes up so much. So I think in an apples to apples comparison, a free society would be able easily to repel some huge army coming in with a fraction of the manpower, just like you know, US farms can produce way more wheat with just a few farmers compared to some other country that's more heavily statist. All right, so again, I, I don't have time to dwell on that, but I just want to mention if people are worried about standing armies turning against, you know, turning into the state, I, I don't think there would be standing armies. Okay, so let me now spend some time on these, these common objections here. Wouldn't the mafia become the government? Okay, so number one, the mafia is much cooler than the government, right? <laughs> And so my, you know, the, the glib response, they're, they're worried, like, okay, so the mafia right now would do what it did, and then over time it would turn into the government. And so the glib response is say, okay, well, at least we get eight years of having a cool mafia before they turn into what we have right now. So what, what, you know, well, in other words, it's saying, we don't want to have this because it might turn into the system we have right now, so let's keep the system we have right now. Just, I know I said that fast, but think that through. That doesn't make any sense at all, okay? It's like saying we couldn't have anarchy because then Donald Trump would be president. Work with me, people. All right. <laughs> Beyond that, though, let me give a more substantive response. Right now, look at all the areas where the mafia is in their power centers. It's all areas that are either outright prohibited or heavily regulated by the state. Right? The mafia makes its money on gambling, prostitution, drug trafficking, illegal guns, perhaps. Okay? They also, depending on the area, might be heavily involved with labor unions. And again, that's not a free market outcome. The reason labor unions have so much strength in our current system is because of special privileges that the state gives them. Okay, so those are all the areas. You know, so yeah, the mafia makes money, you know, they hire hitmen and stuff, but that's not, their, that's not their business model, right? It's not that the mafia makes its money from killing people. That's just the way they sort of maintain their empire. The, the revenues flow in from the fact that they, they sell services to willing customers that can't get it through legal channels because the government either regulates it a lot or makes it outright illegal. And so far from strengthening the mafia, the more you shrink the state, the weaker the mafia becomes. And we have a clear cut, you know, as far as these things go in the social science, a clear cut example. The mafia, the organized crime was clearly stronger under pro alcohol prohibition, right? And then once they legalized that stuff, organized crime's ability to engage in, in the alcohol trade just disappeared. And so likewise, if they legalized you know, cocaine and things like that, the mafia or organized crime would no longer be involved in those areas. And if they legalized all these other things, the mafia would shrink. So that, that's the problem. The type of people that go into organized crime have a comparative advantage 
in doing criminal activity. And so if you reduce the state's arbitrary prohibition on things, you're reducing the scope for the mafia to uh, thrive in. Okay, let me do one, one, so this one right here, wouldn't warlords take over? If you Google my name in that title, I have a whole essay at Mises.org where I talk about that. So why don't you go ahead and look that up. This, I got like one minute left here. Let me just mention, wouldn't a neighboring state invade? So here, notice that in, in practice, right, there are countries that were neutral, like, like Switzerland, for example, and, and lots of countries that are heavily armed, but they don't pick fights, they don't form alliances with other groups, and if, in most states, even aggressive totalitarian states, kind of leave them alone because there's no re you know, they're not a threat, right? And so, uh, so there's, there's that element. A, a, a group of Rothbardians somewhere don't pose a threat in the immediate future. The only threat they really pose to states is their very existence being a beacon, an example to the world that look, freedom works, but a state doesn't need to worry about them developing intercontinental ballistic missiles that would kill a million people. That would be illegal in their own courts. That would be collateral, that would just be mass murder. You, it would be illegal for a defense firm in a Rothbard agency to go kill a bunch of people in some other country, and so you wouldn't have to worry about them doing that. Their own court system would stop them from aggressing against their neighbors, so they're not a threat. Beyond that, though, uh, let me just flip the last point I'll make is a lot of people will say something like, oh, so a little group of Rothbardians, they would get destroyed by Nazi Germany, so therefore your system doesn't work. And I could say, guess what? F status France got destroyed by Nazi Germany, so therefore status defense clearly doesn't work, right? And so all, all this stuff, you have to use apples to apples. The claim is not libertarianism makes you invulnerable to bullets. Don't, don't test this at home. This is why we're against testing. <laughs> That's not the claim. The claim is freedom makes you effectively mobilize your resources more than other systems. Okay, and so for a given level of technical knowledge of people with their sharp skill, you know, sh sharp shooting skills and so forth, the resources, ability to build tanks, boys, you can organize your military defense more effectively if you use freedom to move those resources around than if you centrally plan it. That's true when it comes to food production. It's true when it comes to military defense. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.